while on the way here today. So I'm arriving to a new place that I've never been to before, aware that I'm going to meet loads of faces, people that I've never met, people I've never seen before, I only know Jane, and I'm a little bit nervous. So I'm going to lead a talk about imposter syndrome, and a little part of me thinks, but what if I'm an imposter? How dare I lead a talk on imposter syndrome when I have these feelings? When I feel a bit nervous to do a talk for people? When I feel like, what if what I have to say isn't good enough? Who am I anyway? Who do I think I am? What if the people in the audience look at me and think, who is she to tell us about imposter syndrome? Who does she think she is? So these are all the thoughts that I've had, and probably some of you relate to them. But I thought I'd just go first and be vulnerable, and just be my true authentic self, and those are my honest feelings. Now I could then lead that into more things and think, well, what if it goes wrong? You know, what if they laugh at me? What if they don't invite me back and Jane feels silly because she said it, told everybody I was gonna be so amazing and I, I wasn't, and I've let her down? Or, what if it all goes really well? What if everybody likes me? Or what if everyone got something from the talk? What if I feel proud of myself that I did it anyway? What if I also learned from you? Then next time Jane asks me to come back and do a talk, I have a little bit more confidence because I've been here already. I have a little bit more experience because I've learned from you what you need. Maybe you've taught me something and then I can do a better talk. But it starts by doing that first talk. So no matter how I feel, I still have to stand here and I have to learn from this experience. So there is no failure for me. Whatever the outcome is, whether I stutter, whether I cry, whether I feel silly, whether you laugh, I'm going to leave being a better person. And when I come back, hopefully those things will be less and less and my confidence will go up and up. So my name is Nicola Chan and I'm a body confidence coach. So I would feel less of those things if I stood here and spoke to you about body confidence because that's what I talk about all the time. I speak less about imposter syndrome, however, I'll tell you a little secret. Body confidence is the title. I help people with feeling who have negative body image and have issues with disordered eating and eating disorders. Those are the top layer things. But underneath that, there is some imposter syndrome. There is some low self-esteem. There is some unworthiness. There is some childhood trauma. Now all of us, I don't know all of your stories, I've been meeting some of you just now and getting to know you, but we're all human. So it doesn't matter what title you have, or what you're here for today, underneath that you're a human. So I was saying this to Raph, my girlfriend, earlier, that when you do a talk, they say, imagine everybody naked in the audience. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to a corporate place. <laughs> How about I let everyone in their dressing gown? Because you might have a label and you might be a corporate person, you might be a manager or somebody really important, but that just adds in the pressure and, and then increases the imposter syndrome. Whereas if I just see you as humans, as mums, that I've been learning a lot of your mums, I'm a mum, we relate. I'm also a woman, this is International Women's Day, we're all the same. We all go home and get on our dressing gown and our slippers. So if I imagine you're all sitting here doing that, it's less scary. So maybe you can imagine... I'll just pop behind here and I'll just come out in a dressing gown. <laughs> Burlesque, so that's not <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so where was I? Body confidence. Yeah, so underneath those top layers are all of the um, issues that we face. So whether it be body confidence and food issues, negative body image, it could be something else. It could be alcohol, it could be gambling. So these are all of the top layers, but it's the reason why we reach for those things that's, that's underneath. So this is one of those things. So what is imposter syndrome? I've just shared with you something that I have felt and the inner self-talk, that inner critic, some of the words that came up to me. You might have felt that you shouldn't be here, you don't deserve to have this job, that you're not good enough, that you will fail, that people will laugh, that nobody wants to see that. Now, in my job as a fitness professional, so this is how I became a body confidence coach, I've been a fitness professional for 16 years, and if I ask any of you what is a fitness instructor, a lot of people, when I've been on holiday and I'm sitting there in, their, in a bikini and they say, what's your job? And I say, I'm a fitness professional, they look me up and down. So instantly I knew that to be a fitness professional, you have to look a certain way. 
I was also taught this when I went to college that you are your brand. You know, people will want personal training off of you if they want to be like you. So I again had all of this pressure that I need to be perfect. Like there was this standard that I had to achieve, this body, and then I also had to maintain that. So even when I did get that, this is me being a bodybuilder, what I thought would be perfection, I was actually not very well. I was suffering with an eating disorder, I had body dysmorphia, I was binge eating at home. So I was telling people in the industry, in my classes, my clients, how to eat, how to exercise, how to be fit and healthy, and although I looked fit, because this is the picture of the health and fitness magazine, this is the look that they give you, so you think health and fitness, I was fit, but I wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy to have no periods. Mm -hmm. I was trying for a baby and I couldn't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy to be binge eating and then restricting your food. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy to be dreaming about food, teeth nattering away because I'm not eating enough in the daytime. It's also not healthy for your mindset. So I felt like an imposter. I wasn't being honest about my own struggles and yet I was in that industry leading the way. So you may relate to some of that, whether you've been into fitness or not. You may relate to what I said before about the, the words that you might say inside your head. And some of the reasons we have them are unrealistic expectations. So I said I felt like I needed to be perfect. That was unrealistic. We're human. And although I achieved that, there's levels. You know, you have to, if you go on this diet, you have to come back to normal. You can't say like that forever. I started to think I was that and that I was a failure if I couldn't maintain it. So we set the bar so high and then obviously we don't achieve it. And if we didn't feel like we were good enough, we then have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I knew I was never going to be good enough. You might compare yourself to someone else. And I use this a lot with body confidence. We might compare the way we look with someone. And comparison is a thief of joy. A sunflower is not less beautiful than a rose. They're both beautiful in their own right. You might compare your work to someone else's work. Their presentation. You don't know how many hours they worked on it. You don't know how bad they thought they were and how much debilitating thoughts they had about their own work. You just see the finished product. We do it with social media. We see someone's highlight reel and yet we see ourselves in the dressing gown and the slippers looking at ourselves in the mirror like this and, and we compare ourselves. We compare the body, we compare the lives, we compare the success, the lovely holiday and we don't feel like we're enough. We also might have fear of failure. So we doubt our abilities even if we've succeeded before. We can also have fear of success. What if I am successful but I then can't handle it? I might be overwhelmed. So these all come from our beliefs. And what are beliefs? A belief is just a thought that you've thought over and over and over again and now it's become a belief. Beliefs create a cognitive lens which you interpret the events in the world and this lens serves as a selective filter through which you sift through the environment for evidence that matches up to what you believe. Did you know that you have five senses? So we've got visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory and gustory. Now we're all together here having this one experience. In five years time, I might speak to Jane and ask her about this experience and she might say, oh, I remember your blue hair and, and the blue here and here and all of the colours in the room. She might be very visual. I re might remember that I was really warm, that, you know, the temperature of the room because I'm more kinesthetic, I'm thinking about my feelings. Somebody else might remember the emotions. They might forget all the words that I said but remember the emotion that I made them feel because of their sensories that they're using. So we all have those different sensories. Some of us are more visual, some more kinesthetic, and so on. But we also filter the world because of our beliefs. So what we value and what we believe from the age of zero to seven, and then that lasts in adulthood. So it might be that my parents told me that I was rubbish from those ages, and I took on that belief. And now I'm filtering the world through this feeling that I'm rubbish, and therefore I see it. Does that make sense? The same way two people can have an argument if you were to record it, the actual facts are there, 
But because we're getting billions of bits of information in any one second, we have to filter things. It's too much to handle. But we filter through those visual kinesthetic and through our values and beliefs. So if you feel that you're not worthy, the outcome of the argument will support your belief and the partner that you're arguing with will have a different outcome supporting their belief. The orange jumper. I love this one. I also have a, my a famous orange jumper. It's my favourite. <laughs> and someone told me this actually in a, a business course that I was doing about the orange jumper. And they said, if I shout at you and I say, I hate your orange jumper, like none of you are wearing an orange jumper, maybe over there. <laughs> so you might be like, oh my gosh, she's talking to me. She hates my orange jumper. And then you feel it because I've just said something horrible to you. It's, it's horrible, it's ugly, I hate orange. And then you're feeling it, whereas everybody else is saying, you're crazy. I'm not wearing an orange jumper. What are you talking about? And you feel nothing because you just think, oh, she's crazy. Let her just carry on thinking what she likes. But I'm wearing a green jumper. You know, I'm confident in my green jumper. So the only way that it can stick, you know, the shoe fits. If you feel, if, you know, when you were younger and someone said, you're not worthy, you're wearing the I'm not worthy top, and someone said, you're not worthy, it fits. Mm -hmm. So again, they're confirming your belief. Otherwise, it's just water off a duck's back. have to read this bit. I'm not sure if any of you are into personal development um, therapy. This is new work that I've come into, in, come into my knowledge called Parts by Richard Swartz. I have done some parts in my NLP training which is when I became a mindset coach and we do parts integration. So we often use, work, use words like a part of me feels like this and a part of me feels like that and quite often if there's two parts and there are many, but obviously for today we're just going to talk about two because it's a lot easier. We could do a whole other workshop on that. Um, but we might feel in conflict because a part wants you to do something and a part doesn't. So say for example this talk, a part of me says, oh you're really confident you can go into a talk. And then another part says, oh no, but what if they laugh at you? So this example here, the, the one that says they might laugh at you might be my inner child. That inner child may have an experience, an actual memory that you have, where you stood up in class <coughs> and you talked to people and the outcome was not desirable. Maybe you were bullied, maybe you were laughed at, maybe you went terribly wrong and you have all those feelings and emotions that happened in that moment and that part of you is still that age. So although you might be 30s, 40s, 50s and you've got other parts of you that have become confident, you've done lots of talks and they went really well, in this moment that little part can come in. So even when I'm talking to you now, I could have that part pop in, the one that was in the car telling me you're an imposter, it could pop in in the middle of a conversation. You might have noticed you're sitting here listening to me, but your own thoughts are coming in. Sometimes they talk to you, sometimes they're maybe saying, oh, I agree with her, or who does she think she is? <laughs> you know, they're, they're always talking to you. And obviously that it could be quite loud because there are more than just two. But for example, the inner child, the one that's not gonna be desirable in this moment right now, who might say they might laugh at you, I need to overcome that by listening to the higher self. So my higher self is the one that said, yes, go and do this talk. Stand here and do your best. And the outcome is okay, whatever happens. I said I was gonna read it and I just spoke anyway, so I'm just gonna <laughs> read this. If some of it repeats, apologies. So some of this could be parts relating to the subconscious mind, feelings and emotions from the past, the child. Parts work is built up on the idea that the self is made up of different parts that can either conflict or support one another. I came to the knowledge of parts through NLP where we use the tool called parts integration where we've got the two decisions and we bring them together because they both have the highest positive intention. So it could be one of my parts wants me to binge eat or wants me to reach for alcohol. Now although that's an undesirable thing because I want to be healthy and I don't want to have those issues, I don't want to be out of control and have this behaviour, so I have another conflicting part and now I've got this two conflict going on inside my head. If I ask this part, what is happening here? Why do you want me to have the alcohol? Why do you want me to binge on the food? If you ask why, 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 there's always a positive reason at the top. It might be that I'm suffering trauma right now and if I look at all those emotions, it's too much to handle in this moment, so I need to numb. So I might need to numb with the alcohol or numb with the food. It doesn't know that the long-term effects are negative for me, it's in the now, this is going to be a positive outcome. Right, the other side that doesn't want me to do that also wants a now positive outcome. And if you, why, why, why this side, the two sides actually come together and mean the same thing. All of my parts are good, they all want to help me. 
that this child actually wants to help me because they're saying, don't do that, because if they laugh, you're not going to feel nice. So how about we don't put ourselves in that situation to begin with? So that's the positive outcome. We stay safe. This one, well, I want to grow and I want to be better at things. I want to personally develop myself. I want to be confident. I need to do the things to, to gain the confidence. So I also have a positive outcome here. So parts are sub-personalities. We are born with them. Essentially, we have multiple personalities. We only hear about it as a diagnosis when people have a distinct, it distinctly worse due to trauma. So although your parts might exhibit undesirable behaviour or voices, they are all good. They all contribute to your survival and have a positive intention towards your life. For example, when thinking about imposter syndrome, your part exhibiting those voices, the inner child, they may have experienced the bullying, as I said, at school, and don't want to feel the shame, humiliation, and rejection that you felt. The part of you that knows you can do the public speaking, that part that is great at work, that puts your name down for things, that's your higher self. So another example, when I was suffering with binge eating, there was a part of me driving that behavior because to make me eat now, it's best for my survival. It doesn't care what I look like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Has anyone got any questions on parts so far before I carry on? Okay. Criticism. So we all grew up in families where we had good <coughs> behaviour reward, bad behaviour punishment. So it could be that you were dancing when you were a child and a parent came along and laughed at you and said, why are you dancing like that? It's so silly. And you thought that was bad. You thought you were bad. So you stopped the dancing. And now you might be an adult who needs alcohol to go and dance. It literally could just be that comment that an adult made when you were a child that stopped you from dancing because you felt shame dancing. And we might have loads of different examples of where a parent has said something and now it's become our belief. So it was a thought. It, they've said something, now it's a thought that you say over and over again and now it's a belief. So one way to combat this I've actually done this before in a group, which is a nice, nice exercise to do. I won't do it today, but if Jane fancies doing it another time. <laughs> if you think about it, the parents were above you, they were looking down on you and pointing at you, and a great exercise is to have someone sitting in the middle and they're saying positive things to you instead, so it's like reinforcing um, a nice affirmation to how great you were at something rather than how bad you were. So this is why we can also become perfectionists. So we don't want to get things wrong, we don't want to be told off by the parents that we think we have to be perfect in order to get their love. So hands up, who's ever felt like an imposter? Have a look around the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that if you've never felt like an imposter, you've never played big enough. Because you stay in the comfort zone if I didn't come here and I listened to those voices, I'd stay comfortable, I'd stay safe. I wouldn't feel like an imposter. But also, I wouldn't have the magic happen, that beautiful outcome. Now for me, I put the little white rabbit there to remind me, my, I said to you I did burlesque. My burlesque name is Alice, which comes from Alice in Wonderland, which is why we had the woman falling down the rabbit hole at the beginning. And one of my first performances was about a childhood trauma. With burlesque, I don't know if you are familiar with burlesque, but it's a very creative art form which you can literally do anything you want. There is traditional burlesque with feathers and fans, but there's also storytelling. You could talk about depression if you want to through your movements and the way that you perform on stage. So I was doing essentially that. And as I was practicing it and, and leading up to the event, my inner voice was so loud. It was getting louder and louder and louder. No one wants to see this. It's not traditional burlesque. Because also in a burlesque audience, everyone's whooping and cheering is very high energy and fun, and mine was about trauma. They were going to be silent. And they were. So it was really scary. But I realised then that the voice was so loud because I'm so far out of the comfort zone, which means there's going to be such a big reward. So I knew it was worth it. So now I know, actually, if the voice comes up, it's a positive, because it means I'm going to have the great outcome, and I think that's worth it. So we know it's International Women's Day, and women do feel more of an imposter than men. Some of us have spoken about this before we started this talk, that probably someone said it was in men's DNA. 
that men probably feel really confident in themselves because maybe they've been boosted a bit more than women because of over time with the oppression of women. But we're also told things like, be seen and not heard. You know, like you need to be beautiful, that all your worth is tied up in how you look. Things like that have an impact, not just on your body confidence, but in how you are at work. Because as I said, we are all those women at home with the dressing gown on. We're all human. And if you don't feel confident who you are, it's you you take to work. It's you you take to all your meetings. We're told that you're not worthy unless you fit the beauty standards. Uh, we're told to compare to other women as well. So if some woman has something, it means you can't have it. Or if you have it, it's taking away from her. So sometimes you, you apologize for yourself and you let her have it. Because we don't feel worthy of it. Whereas there's an abundance of whatever it is and she can have it and you. And you can support each other like the rose and the sunflower. So, one of the ways I overcome imposter syndrome, because I can only speak about my experience, obviously there's lots of research and other people have been to other talks about imposter syndrome, but my preferred way that I'd love to share with you is a growth mindset. Has anyone heard of a growth mindset? So we have obviously a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, and it's that growth mindset where I said to myself, regardless of the outcome, I'm going to learn from it. So even if I stumble and fall, I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to go again. So it's resilience that keeps me going, it's bravery that gets me here, but that whole process is the growth mindset. So if I keep doing, if I keep knocking all the doors, if I keep showing up, then the outcomes are going to get better, my confidence is going to grow with it, and then I'm going to have less and less of the imposter syndrome. So we were, we were all born confident. I say this about body confidence, well. we were born with the perfect bodies, we didn't have an issue with our bodies, we didn't care what they looked like, we used to run around the house naked, it's only at some point someone said, you're not right. <laughs> and we started to compare ourselves to the media and everything else. So it relates to bodies as well as everything else. It may be that you were born with confidence and you had an amazing parents and they boosted your confidence and said, yeah, go and do whatever, you can be a doctor, you can be whatever you want, we su fully support you. And so you had all that confidence of your parents. And if you've had that, Maybe something happened, you got an abusive relationship and your confidence got knocked down. And because you lost it, you don't know how to get it back. My experience, I was born with confidence, as we all were, and I didn't have anybody boost my confidence, and my confidence was low. I had experiences that made me feel like I'm not worthy, I'm not enough, and I grew my own confidence, so I feel like I can always get it back. And I have had experiences, abusive relationships and so on, and trauma and whatever, and I have built myself back up. So because I now know I can do that, I know I can keep getting back up. And again, that's the growth mindset. So it doesn't mean if you haven't experienced it. If you're on your first dip right now, this is positive confirmation that you can do that, that you can grow your confidence. Like performing a mile, no one knew they could do it until someone did it first. And once they've seen it, then suddenly everyone was doing it. Although I still haven't managed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe six minutes. <laughs> So you might have heard of the expression fail forward. So we're always going to fail, but we need to not be scared to fail. Someone asked me earlier if this was um, what I do, lion dancing or dragon dancing. This is a lion, and I wanted to use this image to represent practice. So when I first got into lion dancing and kung fu, it's just a, a side thing that I do, um, there was a lot of pressure. I was told that this thing has to be perfect. And because of old me in the fitness industry that tried to do everything perfect, I put a lot of that pressure onto this. If you get it wrong, it could be disrespectful. You might, it's like, not with honor. So there's a lot of pressure now to do it right. So as women, we quite often brush off compliments. For example, someone says, I love that amazing dress you're wearing. And you're like, oh no, no, this old thing. Oh, I got it from the charity shop, it only cost me fiver. We do that, don't we? Or, or someone came in earlier and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I've got mud on my feet. We're always apologising for ourselves, and we're always brushing off positive feedback. So although it might be a compliment, it might be about your dress, it might be about aesthetics, which is a you know, surface level, but it might also be about your work that you did. It might be you did a really good project. It might be you doing really good things in the world. And if you keep brushing them off, then you're not going to feel worthy, you're, not good, you're going to feel the imposter. So, 
I'm going to throw some things at you now. <laughs> to catch. <laughs> they won't hurt you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> nice catch. <laughs> that was a good catch. <laughs> So you may have dropped it, you may have caught it. You dropping it or batting it away is like you batting away someone's compliment. So have a look at what it says on there. Next time someone says something positive about you, whether it be a compliment about your dress or whether it be you did a great presentation, I want you to take that compliment and put it in a jar. So you can see that although it might start with one compliment, you start to hear it. It's the same as when you be grateful, if you have a gratitude journal, because you need to put in there every day. Say for example you did a 30-day journal of gratitude, one day you might not be feeling grateful because you want to do a 30 days, you start looking for something to be grateful for. And because you're looking for them, you find it. The same way we're feeling negative, we look for negative confirmation and then we find it. So this exercise here is for you to find those positive feedbacks and to keep them. So by the end of the year or month or however long you're doing it for, let's have a look at the jar. Next time someone says to you, if you could just hold that up, <laughs> can you do this piece of work for us? Do you go, oh, I, yeah actually, I think I can. So that's your task. To get a jar full of uh, ping pong balls <laughs> and write on them positive things, notes in your phone, I'd like you to ask yourself. Think about the last time you felt like you were an imposter. I want you to ask, what do I feel? <laughs>